Welcome to our evening service here at Great Vic. If you are visiting with us this evening, and I've noticed a number of visitors around, uh, you're very, very welcome uh, as well uh, as those for, uh, who call this their church home. Um, it's good to be together this evening. I noticed Connor and Jen there uh, in this evening. I didn't realize you guys were here. You're very welcome as well. And to everyone else uh, who's made it in this evening. It is such a privilege, isn't it, to gather together and with one heart, one voice, to just worship the Lord together to draw near to him in prayer, to hear his word. It is a privilege of privileges, and we're so thankful to be able to be together. Hopefully you received this uh, little bulletin as you're coming in, or, or this morning, or if you haven't uh, already, do just pick one up. Everything's in there that's happening uh, throughout the week. Um, Jimmy's going to say something in a moment about our church meet meeting on Wednesday evening. And uh, then Thursday being St. Patrick's Day, uh, we have uh, an outreach activity going on here at the church. Uh, the information's there, one to three. There's going to be a, a barbecue and just the opportunity to chat to some people about the, the meaning of St. Patrick's Day. Then the following Saturday, two to four, we're going to be out in the markets area again, just inviting people to come to the Mark drama over Easter and just to chat to them about the gospel and the hope that we have in Jesus. So just note those things down and wherever you can help and wherever you feel that you can uh, lean into some of those things, please, uh, you're, you're welcome uh, to do so. Um, and if you're not able to be there in person, then please be there in prayer before the throne of grace, just asking for the Lord's help in all the work we're doing. Jimmy, if you don't mind coming ahead and just giving us that uh, announcement about our meeting on Wednesday then, and we'll have our call to worship. Thanks. This is a notice for all church members. Annual church business meeting as set out in the Constitution, section 5.2, will be held this Wednesday, the 16th of March at 7.45 p.m. As part of the business to be considered is the election of church officer bearers. I can confirm the following nominations Clifford Manley, Elder, Jason Cardwell, David McKillen, Joanna Durr, Chris Cardwell, Jonathan Graham, Rachel Graham, Cameron Grieve, and Nicola Peacock have been nominated to serve as deacons. The election will take place this Wednesday night. I can also say that there are agendas here and there are minutes of the meetings previous from October to the present. Please take one. And don't be coming down on Wednesday and say, oh, Jimmy, have you got an agenda? Have you got it? They're here. Take them. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Jimmy. In Hebrews 13.5, we have this lovely exhortation to always keep Christ as our treasure. We read there, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Let's stand together and praise the Lord with our opening two hymns. Be thou my vision and you're my strength when I am weak.
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, we're here again this evening, gathered together to lift our eyes together to you, our fountain of all that is good. And we love you tonight, our God. Father, we love you because you have first loved us. And you've loved us and sent your son Jesus into this world who willingly came and loved us and gave himself for us. Knowing the reality of the sin of our lives and our rebellion and weakness, Jesus came to save us because we're too weak to save ourselves. In fact, your word tells us, Father, that we were dead in trespasses and sins. We once lived in darkness, in the dungeon of our condemnation. But Father, we thank you so much that Jesus kicked down the door of that dungeon and he flamed it with his light and he broke off our chains of condemnation and sin and he scooped us up and he gave us life. When we were dead, you made us alive with your son. And you forgive us all our sins in your son. And you count us righteous in your son. You have blessed us, Father, with every blessing in the spiritual realms in your son. What a treasure we have in Jesus. And because of the accomplishments of Jesus, Father, through your son, you have delighted to send forth your spirit. And now we have you, the Father, and the Son making your home in our lives through the indwelling Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Father, for the gift of your Spirit. Jesus said it would be good for us that he would go away because he would send another. He would send the Spirit. Because of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, we are led into the truth the Holy Spirit regenerates us, opens our eyes to see the glory and beauty and treasure of Jesus, to see the accomplishments of Jesus so that, that we can come to you, Father, and we are welcomed into the happy land of the Trinity. We get to enter in as sons adopted into your family, Father, through your Son, and your Spirit dwells in us, crying out, Abba, Father, testifying with our own spirit that we are sons of the living God. How wonderful and blessed we are, Father, if we are in Christ. And Father, we come this evening to worship and rejoice in you. We come to look to you again because we are so needy. We're so fragile. Lord, we're up and down all the time. Sometimes we walk closely with you and some, sometimes we're lethargic and we drift and fall asleep and we want to confess our sins tonight. You see the reality of what's going on in our lives right now. We open up our lives to you. We're sorry, Lord, for our sin and our weaknesses, but we thank you, Father, that those sins and weaknesses do not define us anymore because of Jesus. You don't want us to live under those gray skies of condemnation because those skies have broken open for us in the death and resurrection of Christ, you invite us to live under those clear blue skies of your grace. You want us to live in the goodness of the gospel and we pray that you would help us to do that as we look forward into this week. Help us to live in the goodness of who we are in Christ. Father, you're our rock, our refuge, our stability in these unstable times. And we pray for one another, Lord, that you would help us Grow our faith, increase our love for each other. Sanctify us that our characters would more fully reflect the beauty of your son. Help us to be a people who live in hope, looking to that day when Christ will return, remembering always that we are a people in between two great comings, the first coming of Christ, the coming of grace, and the second coming of Christ, the coming of glory. And until that day, Lord, sustain us, keep us faithful, help us to encourage and cheer one another on, give us wisdom, give us humility, Father, bring forth the fruit of your spirit in our lives and help us, Lord, to be a loving people who care not just for one another, but also care for our city, 
for our land, for this island of Ireland, Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland. And Lord, as we look then more broadly, we pray for the nations this evening to know you. We pray for the raising up of more and more workers to go to unreached peoples, that we would see more and more people across unreached peoples finding the hope that we enjoy in Christ. And Lord, we, uh, as we're continually praying, we're praying again for Ukraine this evening and for our brothers and sisters there, especially whatever their Sunday looks like today. Strengthen them, help them, and uphold them with your righteous right hand. And we pray that in time, you would bring an end to this war and that there would be peace and diplomacy and talks that would be established that bring an end to the horrible suffering we're seeing. These are groans of a fallen world, Father. And we know that one day those groans will cease. They will give way to glory. And until that day, Father, keep us faithful, we pray, and encourage our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, please do open up to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And David and Joanne are going to read for us uh, from Ecclesiastes 5, 8 to 6, 12. Thank you. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness... Do not be amazed and tell your your iPad not to turn off. Oh, come on. Sorry. Um, Do not be amazed at the matter, for the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the fool's stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad adventure. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he can carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find employment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honour, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes in vanity and goes in darkness and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. 
Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to the one place. All the toil of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool? And what does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. Whatever has come to be has already been named and it is known what man is and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity, and what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? Thanks, David and Joanne. Well, we're going to uh, stand and sing again of the trustworthiness and sufficiency of the Lord. Christ is mine forevermore will be our second hymn and we'll start with the Lord's my shepherd. So let's stand and praise together.
be seated. And Elizabeth's going to come and lead us in our prayers for the church and the world just before Simon comes to speak. Thanks, Elizabeth. Let us come before our God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father and our gracious God, we come to you in prayer this evening knowing that it is such a privilege. Thank you for the day that we have had worshipping you and learning from your word together with our church family. May we never take that freedom for granted. We praise you for your grace in our lives that we stand united in Christ by his blood. We've come from death to life in him and set free from our sin and confident in our eternal life. Lord, help us to each live worthy of our calling and daily to be made holy as you are holy. Lord, you are the creator of this world. In it, you reveal your glory in the plants and the animals and the sunsets and the seas. And we thank you for the majesty that we see in it. We know that it is broken and groaning and awaiting the day of Christ's return when all will be made perfect and new again. Lord, we see the evidences of this brokenness on the news screens every day, wars and rumors of wars. And at the moment, our hearts are so burdened for the atrocities we see in the Ukrainian war in the Yemeni civil war in Syria and in so many other parts of this world. We pray for you to protect those who are vulnerable from the hands of their enemies, that those fleeing the country will find safety and love and hear the hope of Christ. And we ask that those who remain will be able to have humanitarian aid, medical supplies, food and shelter. We pray for our brothers and sisters in your church in Ukraine. Lord, give them strength for every day, peace and joy in you, and use them too in this time to speak to the sick and sorrowing, the hopeless, and to share that in Christ alone hope is truly found. Lord, help to your church in Russia to be a light in the darkness in such a difficult time to speak into. Lord, for the world leaders, we pray, asking that you give them wisdom, cool heads, and clarity to protect their nations. Lord, we ask for mercy. We ask for peace and for de-escalation of the violence. We pray that you are glorified by all these decisions. And for Putin too and his governing officials at the moment, Lord, only you can soften their hearts um, and we entrust that to you. For persecuted Christians too throughout the world, Father, we ask that you be the joy of their hearts and their strength and security every day. Father, we know that you are in control and you work all things for your glory. We thank you that we do not need to fear, for you are victorious over sin and death itself. You are a God of all compassion. You are abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Our rock and our fortress and our hope is in you. Lord, we pray closer to home in Belfast. We thank you for our city and our home. And Lord, we know that you are work here um, to build your church. We thank you for the work of the Christian unions with students. We thank you for the work amongst refugees here, for that of Brody and Abe Aubrey in our church, and for those involved in the English language classes. May those who have had security of their homes taken away from them find the solid rock of Christ. We pray ahead of the Mark drama, of evangelism opportunities in the build up to Easter. Please may many come into our midst here into Great Vic and hear the gospel of Jesus. We ask that people come to put their trust in Jesus as Lord and we pray that we see extension of your kingdom here in Belfast. We pray for our church family too here in Great Victoria. We thank you um, that we can be a family together, that we would be united in love and faithful to your word. You know each one of us, the weeks we've come from and those we are going into, our concerns and our struggles, and we know that you care for each one of us. We pray for those who would love to be here with us this evening, um, but who are unable to for sickness or work, and we pray to you for the missionaries from our church. We ask that they would all be encouraged and strengthened. Father, finally we ask that you would be with us now as we come to your word. May our minds be focused and our hearts be ready to be shaped by it. Be with Simon as he teaches us from Ecclesiastes. We thank you that our lives and our work and our labor are not meaningless or in vain when they are done for your glory. Father, we ask that you use us to be vessels for honorable use wherever you have placed us. In your son's precious and holy name we do pray. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. 
It is uh, great to be back in the book of Ecclesiastes again this evening. If you've uh, got a Bible with you, please do open that up, back up to that passage that David and Joanne were reading for us earlier from chapter 5, verse 8, all the way through to chapter 6, verse 12. I want to uh, start this evening uh, by playing a very brief audio clip from a pretty well-known movie, I think, one of the most famous Christmas movies around, It's a Wonderful Life. Here goes, let's see if this works. Bucks on you. Oh, no, no, we don't use money in heaven. Oh, yeah, that's (laughs) right. I keep forgetting. (laughs) Comes in pretty handy down here, bub. Okay, if you missed that, that was was, uh, Jimmy Stewart, I think, there. He was uh, expressing his disgust at the angel in front of him, who didn't have any money. I keep forgetting, he says. Money comes in pretty handy down here even if it's not used in heaven. And he's right, isn't he? As we think about it, money comes in pretty handy in this life. If you have money, you can do so many things. You can buy a house. You can go on holiday. You can pay for your kids to go to university and have the best opportunities for their future. If you have money, maybe you can even retire early and then be able to spend most of your retirement sipping cocktails beside a beach. Money makes such a difference in life, doesn't it? We could probably even say that today, in the West particularly, money is pretty much how we define success in life. Personally, if you or your business are making money, you are doing well. If you're losing money, you're not doing well. And if the country as a whole is doing well financially, if the economy is growing, if the deficit is shrinking, well, the country is doing well. It feels like it's never been more the case than today that money matters. And yet, as David and Joanne read through our section earlier from Ecclesiastes 5 and 6, I wonder if you spotted how many times the preacher wants to make it clear to show us that money really isn't what it's all made up to be. That actually, money leads to harm. And there is little hope, joy, or satisfaction found in it, despite what the world around us would say. In typical Ecclesiastes uh, style, we seem to have pretty quickly left the section from before. Last week, we were thinking about appropriately worshipping God, looking up to him, And now, once again, pretty quickly, we find ourselves back in the middle of this quest, right, that the preacher has undertaken in life, as he searched for meaning and profit in life. Ultimately, that big question hanging over the whole book, what does it mean to be human? Last week, he was looking upwards to God, and this week, he's going to make us do that again, but he's going to do that, first of all, by making us again look at the world around us. And he's particularly going to focus in on several things that frustrate him, that trouble him in the world as he looks at it. If you look with me there in verse 8, he opens by considering again oppression. We saw this back in chapter 4 as well. And the preacher is telling the rest of us that as far as he's seen, because of what he's seen, We too shouldn't be surprised when we see oppression and a lack of justice in the world around us. He's like he's saying to us, as surely as life leads to death, well, life also leads to oppression. How and why is that the case? Well, the how is there in verse 8, if you look with me, because important people seem to gather together, looking out for each other, having each other's backs, working together together, to oppress those underneath them. Why? Well, I think then we have to look back, we have to look ahead to what's to come. Because from verse 10 onwards, I think we're going to see that the focus here is that why they would do that is because they want to accumulate wealth and power and possessions so that they can enjoy life more fully. See, money comes in pretty handy down here, bub. So if there's any way we could possibly get hold of money, we should do it, shouldn't we? 
Verse 9 gives us a clue into the preacher's thinking as he points this to this king, this good king, who doesn't oppress but cultivates the land for the good of the people. And this is giving us an idea of where the preacher's going. See, here is the heart of the matter in this section of Ecclesiastes. How should we view money? If so many chase after it, should we do that too? Well, the preacher is going to say a pretty big no to that. Look with me and read with me now verse 10 as he opens. He makes his feelings on this subject so clear. He writes this. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. Above all, this is what the preacher wants us to know this evening. He wants us to know that money and possessions will never satisfy. As we work through the rest of this passage, the preacher is going to make that point clear to us again and again. And to do that, he's created what they, was commonly used in literature of this time, which is a chiasm. It's a bit like that sandwich, right, that we saw this morning in Mark. He does this. He starts in chapter 5, verses 10 to 17, and he gives us three reasons to begin with why money doesn't ultimately satisfy. And then he jumps in chapter 6, verses 1 to 6, to add three more reasons, and he gives us an illustration. And then he leads on to the end of chapter 6, where he gives an overall conclusion on the vanity of the love of money and possessions. And all of these sections around the outside of this chiasm, this sandwich, are pushing us to the center, to the alternative way of life that he presents in the central section there, in chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. So with that structure in mind, to help us think clearly about how the preacher is doing this, we're going to work through the passage in that order. Unusually, we're going to finish there in that central section, but I think that is where he wants us to finish as he makes his argument. So let's get going, first of all, with chapter 5, uh, verses 10 to 17, and the first reason why we should know that money doesn't satisfy. And that is because money multiplies cares and concerns. Look with me to verses at 11 and 12. They say this. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. The point the preacher is making here is this. If you have lots of money, life doesn't magically suddenly become easy and carefree. Instead, it's almost the opposite, isn't it? Lots of money actually brings with it lots of cares and concerns. The preacher uses that phrase there, an increase in people who eat your riches, your goods. If you're rich in money, see, people will be after your money, won't they? Your children, perhaps. The government, perhaps. Hackers in this day and age, right, will be after your money. But not only that, just simply the people that you employ. Your people who look after your ever-increasing business portfolio. All of a sudden, this money brings with it an influx of cares and concerns that before being rich, you might actually not have even thought about before. And of course, behind all of this fear, there's this concern that somewhere along the line, the outgoings will become greater than the incomings, and your money is going to drip away. No wonder, right, compared to the laborer that the preacher speaks about, who goes out to do their hard work in the fields and who comes back exhausted, they sleep well. But compared to that person, this person doesn't sleep well. They've got so many cares and concerns in their life. And of course, they have that nagging fear of losing what they have. 
And that is uh, where the preacher then goes in verses 13 to 14, as he gives us a second reason why we should know that money will not satisfy. And that is because it can completely disappear. See there in verse 13, the example the preacher gives there of the person who has riches, riches which he says actually hurt him, potentially because of what we've just been saying. But then in verse 14, we read that this person loses it all in a bad venture. We're not told the venture. I guess we can imagine one tricked by maybe a seemingly trustworthy friend into investing in their business, only to the next day find the money has completely gone along with the friend. Back in the preacher's day, perhaps a boat containing all your treasures, lost at sea. Today, a stock market collapse, a hacker gaining access to your computer. Whatever it is, this is the reality of money that the preacher wants us to get our heads around this evening. We are not in control of it, and it can disappear just as quickly as it appears in the first place. The possession of money is unreliable. So if we're going to live a life with money front and center, we are never going to be satisfied. We're only one wrong click, one wrong phone call, one wrong business venture from potentially losing everything. And then in verses 15 to 17, the preacher gives us a third reason. A third reason why we should know that money and possessions will never satisfy. And that is because we cannot ultimately take anything with us. It seems like he's continuing on with this same person here who lost everything. But the point he is making is the same for rich, for poor, whether you die rich or die poor. Because if you look there, what he writes in verse 15, he says this, all of us shall take nothing for our toil that we may carry away in our hand. Verse 16, just as we come, so shall we go. With no gain, no profit, nothing for us to hold on to in death at all. This, along with the last reason, is a grievous evil for the preacher. He sees that riches do really exist here on earth. And he sees that some people have so many of them. But they don't find satisfaction. In fact, look how he summarizes all that he said up to this point in verse 17 where he writes about that person who loves money, seeks profit in it, and he writes that all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger, never getting to actually enjoy their money, the lot that they've been given because of the multiple cares they've got now, because of a fear that it might disappear and because they've realized that ultimately they can't take anything with them into death. Now, the preacher hasn't been mincing his words up to now, but just in case we're not listening yet from chapter 5, he now, if we jump over to chapter 6, he continues. He continues into what one commentator describes as one of the darkest chapters in the Bible. And here, he's going to give us three further reasons for us to know about why money, and now clearly also in view, possessions, and the love of them will never satisfy. And he's going to get at that ultimately then by showing us a shocking illustration. Let's see, first of all, that that fourth reason then in verse 2. And we're going to see a fourth reason is that even if we have it all, There is no guarantee of enjoyment. Look there in verse 2 of chapter 6. The example this time is of a man who is even better off than the person back in chapter 5. This person has wealth, possessions, and honor. Three things that we read in in, uh, in 2 Chronicles, Solomon has. Which isn't a surprise, right? Because we've been thinking about in this book... This author, the preacher, is taking on this Solomonic persona. And the point, again, is that this person here is not lacking in anything. They have everything they could ever desire. We're told that despite lacking nothing that he desires, 
God doesn't give him the power to enjoy them. Again, this shocks the preacher as he looks at it. He cannot get his head around this. This is an enigma to him. As he writes at the end of verse 2, this is vanity, enigmatic. It's a grievous evil. A man who has it all, but no actual enjoyment. Adding to the problem is that line in there too, that a stranger ends up enjoying this man's possession and wealth. Most likely referring to the fact that one day he will die. And in this case, his money, his possessions will be passed on to someone else. Someone who he doesn't even know. A stranger is going to benefit from his own hard work. Now, the key question of why this man doesn't ever enjoy all that he's been given by God isn't made clear to us. We're only told that God doesn't give him the power to enjoy it. So is it that we end up laying the blame on God? That's a fair question, isn't it? Is it God that's preventing this man from enjoying what he has? Well, I don't think that's the case. Of course, God is sovereign. That's in view here, isn't it? He is above this lack of enjoyment in this man's life. But fundamentally, once again, all that we've said earlier about the love of money must have played a part in this man's lack of enjoyment. This man does not enjoy his wealth and possessions because he loves them. He loves them too much. This is what he is living for. And yet the wealth and possessions that he sought after actually end up causing him more problems than he began with. And again and again, those money, that money, those possessions are shown to be shaky, unsteady things to live life for. Within this verse, I think, and then also in verse 3 too, is another truth that the preacher wants us to know about money and possessions that will never find satisfaction in them Because even if we have it all, we will always want more. Just one more sports car. Just one more house. Just one more charity set up in our name. One more, one more, one more. Look in uh, verse 3. Although it, it moves on to children and living a long life, I think the idea here is the same. A man has 100 children and lives many years. But his soul is not satisfied with life's good things. It's a comical picture, isn't it, that the preacher is painting for us. Imagine a man with a hundred children. Crazy. But there it is, it's the picture. And you can imagine this man, right? He's got his hundred children, and he turns to his wife and he says, come on, honey, just one more. Come on, I know you're tired. I know it's been a hard life, but number 101 will make all the difference. They're the one who's going to carry on my business venture. They're the one who is going to make me successful in life. Or it's like him turning to his friends after living for 200 years and saying, that's all well and good, but just give me one more year. One more year so that I can just finish that final project that I was working on. One more year so I can visit that place that I never have got to see. Then I'll be satisfied. As the preacher is making clear to us here, even having it all doesn't guarantee enjoyment and satisfaction. In fact, it's almost the opposite, isn't it? The more we have, the more we want. There will always be one thing more. And this life is then shockingly condemned, isn't it, in what comes next. Read with me these shocking verses in verses 3 to 6. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For he comes in vanity and goes in darkness, and in darkness his name is covered. Moreover, the stillborn child has not seen the sun or known anything, yet 
it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years, twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to the one place. I've already said it, but these are shocking words, aren't they? As a pastor, as a father, I read them and I feel uncomfortable. Because the preacher here is referring to one of the greatest trials, one of the greatest sorrows in life, a stillbirth. In some ways, as I was reading it, I just would have preferred he didn't go there. But he does, and I think the reason he does is to really powerfully illustrate what he's been saying to this point. To make absolutely sure that we are not going to pass it by. That we are listening, we're going to take in what he's saying. And the fundamental question that comes out of this illustration, this little exaggerated example, as it were, is this very uncomfortable one, this painful one. And that is, is it possible that you and I could get to the end of our lives and it be said of us, or we could even say of ourselves, a stillborn child would have been better off than me. How could that end up being the case? Fundamentally, because if we live lives like this man, where we never find satisfaction in anything that we have. We never find any enjoyment. The truth is we have found nothing good in life. We've just found that vexation, that sickness, that anger that we saw back in chapter 5. And we've also had to deal with the oppression, life's hardships and difficulties that we see so much around us. If that is the sum total of our lives, no good, only bad, and on top of that, not only that, we then realize that we won't even be remembered beyond our death. I think that's what's being got out there in verse 3, where the man finds no burial site. Well, if that is what our lives ends up being, that's the sum total, no wonder the preacher thinks a stillborn child would be better off. Verses 4 and 5 sum this up, I think. Well, it isn't uh, completely clear. Verse 4 there, I think, is referring, instead of the stillborn, is to referring to the man, not, not like the ESV reading. See, if verse 4 is the man, I think it really helps us see what's going on. The man comes into life and finds that the sum total of it is vanity. And then he disappears off into darkness, doesn't he? In his darkness, his name is covered as any positive or even negative legacy or reputation is left behind, is forgotten, is lost. Well, in contrast to that, even though we're told in verse 5 that the stillborn never sees the sun, that is, they're never born, and they never reach consciousness, it seems, even though that is the case, look at how verse 5 finishes. That stillborn finds rest rather than the man. This, I think, is the key, and I think this pretty much sums up all that we've seen up to this, this point. Money, possessions, things, we need to know that they will never satisfy because we will never find rest in them. A life lived chasing after money and possessions is a restless life. Look at all of those things that come with money and possessions that we've seen to this point. Increasing cares, fears that it could disappear, a realization that one day it will disappear, we will, we will leave it behind, a lack of enjoyment, a striving after one more thing after one more thing. If that isn't a restless life, I don't know what is. And yet, as we look at the life of the world around us, Isn't that the life that so many people are living? Isn't that, in fact, the life that we are called to live according to our culture? Seeing all of this grieves the preacher. It makes him offer that shocking comparison of verse 5. And the men he's been referring to, whether real or made up, they seemingly have everything, don't they? And yet they end up 
with nothing. In fact, worse than nothing. They end up leading restless, painful lives. See how he concludes in verses 6 to 9. Because, because, verse 6, death comes to all, no matter their length of life. And because, verse 7, a man's appetite is never satisfied, like we've been seeing, because of those things, then, in verse 8 there, there is no point in being wise in your life. That is, there is no point in being worldly wise, like we've just been saying. Wise living in the world around us, well, that's going to lead to increased wealth. But there's no point in that because it offers nothing good. A foolish person is just the same. A poor person is just the same. Better, it seems, almost, to have nothing. Instead, just to see good things in the lives of others without having them yourselves than to live a life where you have it all, but are always following the wandering of your appetite, never being satisfied, never finding rest. Living a life like that is summarized in verse 9, as we've come to see again and again in this book, as vanity, a striving after wind. Again, isn't that such a helpful picture? chasing after the wind, grasping after it. You can imagine the man or the woman chasing the latest gust wherever it will go, never able to stop chasing because they can't get hold of it. Round and round and round they go. So what are we meant to do with this? It's been a pretty bleak picture up to this point, hasn't it? Well, through verses uh, 10 to 12, here, I think the preacher is reminding us we are limited. Things are out of our control. And he's reminding us that words aren't going to be the answer. That only leads to more vanity. And instead there in the verse, in the question of verse 12, he is pushing us back to what he has already said, the central section of his argument, of this chiasm, the sandwich that he's been looking at. Look, in verse 12, he asks, doesn't he, who knows what is good for man while he lives in the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? And he's pointing us here back to this central section. I think because if you look with me, he says there, in verse 18, chapter 5, verse 18, he says, what is good? He's answering his question. He says, behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting. Here, here is the contrast, the alternative way of life to what he's been pretty brutally setting up before us now. Money and possessions will never satisfy. They leave us restless if we seek after them with all our lives. So this is what is good. This is what we should do. Let's read verses 18 and 19. Eat, drink, and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. Notice uh, with me in these verses, firstly, that as with the man in chapter 6, everything about life that's described here is given by God. The length of life, what we have in life. God is the giver of everything. But notice the difference here. Because unlike the man in verse 2 of chapter 6, there's something else that that God gives to this man of verse 19. And that is the power to enjoy the things of life. So again, what is the difference? Is it God then just randomly choosing people? Well, this person will enjoy it and this person won't. Of course, as we've said, God is above our decisions and our attitudes. He is sovereign. But I think that is what's in view here, our attitudes. Notice there that phrase in verse 19 to accept his lot. This person of verse 19 accepts the lot he has been given. 
And we saw that same idea, didn't we, at the end of verse 18, where we're told that what is good is to enjoy the lot that God has given us. See, the word for lot there carries with it this idea of an allotted portion. And thinking about life in this way is so completely different, isn't it, to how we've been thinking about money and possessions up to this point. We're told here, as our second point this evening, to accept and enjoy any money and possessions that we do have as our allotted portion. Not seeking after them, not loving them, not clinging on to them, just accepting them and enjoying them. What we have in this life is allotted to us. That is, it is given to us. As we realize that we aren't in control of our wealth and possessions, instead they're things given to us by God and things that he can also take away for reasons that we might well never understand. As we realize all of those things, we are freed from the weight and stress and restlessness that comes with seeking after those things trying to cling on to them with all of our strength. God gives us the things of our life. And part of what it is to begin to enjoy them is to realize that, to accept that, and so also to give him thanks for the good things that he has given to you. Wealth, possessions, long life, whatever those good things might be. God's gift of enjoyment of the things of this life, of the many, many good things of this life, and that we we find, don't we, comes only when we put God in the picture. God gives the power to enjoy the things of life to those who keep him front and center, not the things themselves. Let me say this again, because I think this is really, really important. God gives the power to enjoy the things of life to those who keep him front and center, not the things themselves. When we view what we have as a portion given to us by God, not things we've earned for ourselves, things to be clung on to with everything we can, or things that we, should, we end up dismissing, rubbishing by saying, well, that's all right that I have that, but really what I want is this, and this, and this. When we change that, then we will actually begin to enjoy the portion in the here and now, the portion that we've received. The truth is, inevitably, that portion is going to change, isn't it, as we go through life. Sometimes it will go down. Sometimes it will go up. But that's not the point. The point is that at each and every stage of our lives, God has given us a portion He is the giver of all things, and he has given us right here and right now something that we are meant to enjoy, things for us to enjoy, enjoying them for what they actually are, not for what they might become tomorrow, not for what they might have been in the past, but enjoying them for what they are right now. What is it that frees us up to do that? Because I think as humans, it is a constant battle that we face, isn't it? Above all, as we've just said, it comes from our starting focus being on the gift giver and not on the gifts themselves. Along this line, we read in 1 Timothy chapter 6, a reminder like this from Paul. He says this, Do not set your hopes on the uncertainties of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. As Paul says, God does give us good things to enjoy, and we are genuinely meant to enjoy them. But they're never meant to be our hope. They are never our hope. They're never meant to be our hope because they are as uncertain, as shaky as it comes. But God is not shaky. God is the one that we can hope in, no matter what lot we currently have in our lives. He is unshakable. 
And because of our hope in God and the certainty of that hope, we know, don't we, that we can find rest in God. As Jesus promises in Matthew chapter 11, these amazing words, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In God, in Christ, we find rest for our souls, a sure foundation to lay our lives upon. And in Him, we find an easy yoke, a light burden. Isn't that so true when we think of what Christ demands of us compared to the burden of living a life chasing money and possessions that we've just been thinking about? Look how the preacher sums up a life lived this way in chapter 5, verse 20. He writes this, For he will not much remember the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Isn't that a great image? The point here for us to note, for us to know, is that God is the giver of joy. And no one, nothing else is. No money, no possessions can give joy by themselves apart from God. See there that phrase that the preacher uses, God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. And of course, as Christians today, we have a twofold joy. Firstly, that ultimate joy that we've just been thinking about in God himself, in the one who has made us rich as Christians, richer than anything in the world around us, rich in God because we have been forgiven. We have been redeemed. We have been made children of God, promised with an eternal life to come. We have so many riches in God. We can find joy and hope in him. But then also a second joy then flows out of that. And that joy is in the things that God does give us here and now. Genuine pleasures, like the preacher mentions, again, of food, of drink, of satisfying work. Genuine pleasures of being able to watch a rugby game, even when your team loses. Of genuinely enjoying sitting down and listening to a perfectly crafted piece of music. Genuine pleasures of visiting new countries and places. Genuine pleasures of laughter with friends and family. You yourself can think, can't you, of what brings you joy in your life at the moment? In fact, that would be a great thing to do, wouldn't it? In response to all that we've been thinking about tonight, the preacher really does want us to take pleasure and joy in the things of this life. So why not, when you get home tonight, or maybe in the car on the way home if you're traveling with somebody, discuss or write down or think about maybe even just five or ten things, even simple things that you could give God thanks for, that are a part of your lot at the moment. And then this week, remember to actually enjoy them. It's so easy in life, isn't it, to drift through the week without actually stopping to enjoy the simple things of it. Enjoy your breakfast tomorrow morning. Enjoy your conversation with your colleagues. Enjoy that progress that you make in work. Stop, give thanks to God for it, and enjoy it. He's given it to us for that reason. Don't just drift through your week unthinkingly. Take stock and take pleasure in it. As the preacher makes clear to us, God really does want us to enjoy his good gifts. So let's do that this week, even while we remember that those gifts are never the things that we need to set our hearts and our hopes on. That person is God, but God is the great gift giver. Let's pray as we close.
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you for its relevance. Lord, as we look at the world around us, as we look at our own hearts, the draw to money, the draw to possessions, Lord, it has such a claim on us. Lord, thank you for the preacher's words here that set out so starkly what a life lived for those things will ultimately lead to. Lord, please help us to take those warnings to heart. Lord, free us from that love of money, the root of all evil, as we read elsewhere. Lord, give us not a love of money, but an appreciation of money, of the things that you do give us when you do give them to us, Lord. Ultimately, Lord, help us to give you thanks for the things that we have in our lives and help us not to cling on to them, to hope in them. Lord, fix our eyes on you, fix our eyes on Christ and the hope that we have in him. And then, Lord, we do ask that you would empower us to be able to enjoy the good things, to see them in our lives. Lord, thank you that even as we know that we go through so many trials, you do daily give us good gifts. Help us to see those in our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to close by uh, singing, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. And this is a great reminder, isn't it, of what we have in Christ. Uh, that we sing in the end of the first verse there, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. The frame is sweet, we can enjoy it, but that's not our hope. We come to Christ for that. Let's stand and sing together.
Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, please, this week, will you keep us occupied with joy in our hearts, joy in you and joy in the good things that you give us. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.